You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by the Sketchnote Idea Book, the sketchbook designed for sketchnoters. Equipped with a no-bleed, no-show-through paper, the Sketchnote Idea Book can take almost any marker or pen you can throw at it. Learn more at sketchnoteideabook.com. And now, on with the show. In this episode, I talk with Jay Hostler, a professor at Juniata College in Pennsylvania. He's a scientist who's found an interesting way to represent science with comics. Hear Jay's story about how he got into this space and the relationship he sees between comics and sketchnoting. Hey, Jay, this is uh, Mike Rohde. Nice to talk to you this morning. It is great to be with you, Mike. Well, everyone, this is Jay Hostler. He's on the show with us to talk a little bit about comics and science. So what could you could you possibly think of two cooler things to talk about? And then in <laughs> conjunction with each other, it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup, right? Chocolate <laughs> and peanut butter together. So yes, Jay, my favorite. Thanks for coming on the show and talking about this area and visualization in general and, and just sort of being with us. So I always like to start all of these discussions with context so people can understand a little bit about you. Tell us who you are and what you do. So uh, Jay Hostler, I am a, I am the chair of biology at Junietta College. It's a little, little liberal arts school in central PA. And I teach neuroscience courses and physiology courses, animal behavior courses. But I sort of had a parallel life starting, well, since high school, in which I was cartooning and sort of mimicking a lot of the uh, comic artists that I saw. And those, that, the interest in science and the interest in art sort of ran in parallel for a very long time. And uh, it is a testament to my thick headedness that uh, it was never, never occurred to me to combine those two things in the Reese's uh, cup metaphor that you mm-hmm. just had mm-hmm. until I was uh, about a postdoc. Well, getting ready for my postdoc. And I was reading a book by a guy named Mark Winston called The Biology of the Honeybee. And I can remember as I was reading it. So I was getting ready for the postdoc. The postdoc was a sensory biology postdoc. So my training was as an electrophysiologist. Mm. I was going to be working with honeybees in the context of their ecological sensory um, experience. I thought, well, I should really know more about these critters. And as I'm reading this book, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a great story. Someone should do a comic of this. I mean, it's just the way he wrote it, you know, sort of unfolded with, yeah, it was very visual. And, uh, and it wasn't until about a year later when I realized, well, I guess that could be me. And up to that point, I'd really only done like little cartoony things, right? I'd never taken on this sort of massive visual design challenge of a story, a graphic novel. But in the first year of my postdoc, I applied for two grants, a grant to the National Institutes of Mental Health for a three-year salary. And a $1,500 grant to print the first comic of, of Clan Apis is what it was called at the time. And it was actually through a, uh, a foundation called the Zurich Foundation, which was founded by Peter Laird, who's one of the two Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle people. Oh. And, yeah. So on this, in the same week, I got notification that I got both grants. One was for like you know, about a hundred K over three years. And one was for $1,500. And I will tell you, I was much more excited about the $1,500 grant Mm. (laughs) because it was this real sort of tremendous validation of this not secret thing I was doing, you know, but to have, to have someone say, ah, you know, this is good enough to, to spend money on. And so it was at that point that those two things came together. And the minute I found that I could use comics to visualize and express sort of the sense of wonder that I have about the natural world and to use stories to do it. I think that this is one of the things as scientists we, we shy away from doing, although mm-hmm. we do it naturally, right? Mm-hmm. If we're going to give a talk, we, we wind up telling people this cool story about the cheetah chasing the gazelle, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't done that in print as effectively, I don't think, and certainly not visually with stories as effectively. I think there's a handful of people who are doing it and they do good work, but this is something I think, this is an area I think we need to explore a little bit more. Hmm. 
Well, that's really fascinating. We talked with Nick Zuzanis previously, who did his whole PhD as a graphic novel. Yeah. Uh, so he's definitely pushing the boundaries there. And his, I don't know how far he got into professional uh, comic creation. I think he was probably more like a high level fan, but I, I don't know that we went into that depth, but I wonder how much of it is uh, the sense of feeling that you're not a good enough artist. So I run into this all the time in sketchnoting, and I'm sure it's probably in there somewhere. The idea that a scientist is not a good enough artist to to express these things visually. But then additionally, I wonder too, is there some concern about, like if I tell a story, like people's conception of what story is, is it something that you read at bedtime that's not real, you know, it's fiction or, you know, like the, all these things get tied up with that word in some ways. I think it's getting better, but do you think those two things might be part of it? Yeah, I think that scientists in general, at least in the community I've come from, it's very interesting. So if I would have to characterize the uh, gestalt response of the scientific community, it is typically to be wary of storytelling because of all the different things you can do. You frame things, right? There are these negative connotations. You, you, you deviate from sort of an objective description of what happened by layering it with this subjectivity. But at the same time, on a very personal level, in terms of my direct contacts with scientists who teach, uh, it is in fact a very, very positive thing because those of us who sort of how do I even say this? Those of us who are in the trenches of explanation, right? Those of us who are standing in front of a group of 20 to 30 kids who may or may not be particularly engaged with the course at all, that's typically not the case, or, or maybe just whatever the topic is of the day, there's no better, more effective way of reaching those kids than contextualizing the information. And I think that actually was one of the big things when I was reading your book, context. Uh, and you can use images and text to provide that to a certain content. And you can use it to highlight what's important and what's not, right? So I think that in general, my experience with my colleagues has been very supportive of the approach I take. But I sometimes I wonder sometimes if that isn't uh, because they understand the challenges of teaching that that most of us face. When I go other places and I talk uh, at other places, I can tell sometimes people are a little wary, right? So if I go to a, uh, an R1 institution, uh, before I start talking, there's some guardedness in terms of what I'm going to talk about, you know. And I think that usually effective in, in cracking through most of them, because the, the whole idea here with a story is that you are structuring it to, to provide the context for the information, the scaffolding for the information, right? So my kids right now could tell you a, a jillion things about a movie they saw 10 years ago, right? They, they can recount the plot in ways that I can't. And why is that? Because the information was structured in such a way that it held together for their brain. Had I given them a list of the same facts, that that would not have happened. I think that one of the things that science struggles with is that uh, most of us who do science are deviants, right? So if you could have, if you could have a bell-shaped curve of people and their feelings about textbooks, right? Um, academics would be out on the far tail of that, right? Mm -hmm. So I get, mm -hmm. I get a, I get a comp copy of a textbook. I know what I'm doing Friday night right? This is, this is exciting for me. Mm -hmm. but, but that makes us weird. We're deviants teaching to sort of the middle of that curve, which mm -hmm. that middle of that curve is bright and capable of being engaged, but they don't get into lists of facts sometimes the way we do. And so in order to reach those minds, in order to pull them in, and, and actually in a very utilitarian way, utilize their creativity and their imagination, I think that using images uh, and comics and stories is the most effective way to do that. Hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, story is kind of a universal, just like much like drawing is, it's a language that can be used to reach someone. So I've learned, as I've learned more about story, uh, McKee, like, deconstruct story as like this arc, right? You have to have conflict or you don't have a story. Like 
right. guy buying a Volvo is not a very interesting story, right? Unless <laughs> unless he has to, you know, go over a bridge with alligators or you know, like there has to be some level of that. So it's a it's a form that we've used for a long, long, long time to share. And then if you look at drawing and you go back to like Caves of Lascaux or something, you know, drawing has also been there before language too. So in some ways, story and drawing are kind of bound together. I mean, one is sort of used to express the other as well as, you know, speaking or words or what have you. So in some ways, comics is sort of like in, in a ways, in some ways, an elemental form of storytelling if you couldn't speak it, right? So you right. show the image and you have you have words to describe the thing that you're showing. If well, maybe I, some of that. I think that the Lasco example is a really good one. And I think about it a lot because I sometimes think about human creativity in general as having been sort of fractured, right? So this is my comic book storytelling idea that there was once a crystal of creativity. And at some point in our past, it was fractured into three parts, right? Science, story, and art, at least for mm -hmm. me. So if you go back to those cave paintings, you can look at those images and it's unambiguous what those critters are, right? You, you don't you don't look at some of those cave paintings and say, gosh, is that a bear or an antelope? <laughs> you know, you right. know exactly what it is. And they are they typically are scenes laid out, you know, with warriors or whatever. And so there's or hunters. And so you have a story on the board. It's being expressed by art, but I also look at that and say, okay, I know that's a bear and I know that's a mammoth. And to me, this is early man recording or early woman recording natural history. Mm -hmm. You know, this is them, this is them documenting their ecological environment. This is them being primitive scientists. And so uh, with their observational skills. So for me, I look at those cave paintings and I see all three of these things that I really get excited about. Mm. It was interesting as you were talking about that, this image came to my mind of it's sort of like layers in a way. So like there's the facts, like the big, like the big database of facts, which is like everything in like a big swirling mass. Right. And then you have to frame it and decide which of those facts makes sense in the next layer, which is context. And then on top of context, then you tell story to sort of structure it in a way that makes sense. And then the next layer on top of that is, um, like personal style. So you look at the caves of Lascaux, the thing that's really interesting is all those layers are there. There's facts of the situation as they saw it. There's the context that they provided, which is the best they had was, you know, some chalk or something in a cave where they were right. safe to, to draw with it without being eaten. Um, and then they're telling a story. But on top of that, which is really fascinating, is the style with which that story was told, like the style of the animals, like, you know, it's a bear or an antelope, but there is a certain style to it that comes yeah. through that that person, that personality is on in a layer. That's what um, when I look at sketch noting, especially and, and comic books, too, we were talking before about our favorite, you know, artists or some of our favorite artists in the comic world. Like they have a signature style. When I see Frank Miller, it's mm -hmm. clear that it's Frank Miller or it's somebody deriving from Frank, right. Frank Miller. And if you look right. at my work, you know, it's very bold and strong and sketchy and. I'm very much, I'll admit that I was very informed by the early Daredevil and the stuff that he was doing. And I'm sure yeah. that Frank would tell you he was inspired by people before him who had a certain style and way of do, doing things that he was pushing the boundaries of. So that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I get on Twitter every once in a while. Someone had posted a picture of a cave pear, bear painting and had made the comment that they resented that primitive humans had a better sense of line weight than they did <laughs> <laughs> and it is the line weight on this bear's snout i can still see it it is it's beautiful i mean it's uh it's clearly either brush work or mm -hmm. a tremendously sensitive finger that put it up there but yeah there's there was artistry and science all mixed together mm -hmm. right there at the beginning and i and i you know i take your point about inspiration i mean it's it's to me that is the type of thing that well, my, my train of thought went off the rails right there. I'm not sure where I was going. <laughs> well, that's, 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 why the, why, that's why discussions are so much fun is we can sort of roll with them. Uh, tell us a little bit. So since we have a little, just a break in the action, I'm very curious to hear. So you talked about having students. You're at this one end of the curve. You're excited about textbooks. You're, you're trying to invite and draw your students toward that end. 
Mm-hmm. You probably realize there's only a few that are going to make it all the way to the end that are like you that have those specific love of reading textbooks on the weekend in the bathtub or whatever, right? But <laughs> right. like, there's going to be people that don't quite come, but you, if you can move them a step closer to you to appreciate, like you said, learning about bees and why they're so interesting, like that's a, I would assume that's a big win for you. Talk a little bit about how you work in your, in your classroom and what you see that gets, what gets you excited when you get to do teaching and mixing science and comics together. Yeah. So it's a great question. There was a book, I can't remember what it was, it was a, there was a pull quote on the back of it and a term was used. Uh, and typically I recoil against these types mm. of terms, but it was the term they used was wonder standing. Oh, uh, interesting. And, and I, I, like I said, simultaneously sort of cringe a little bit at that word, but at the same time go, well, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. That is it right there. So yeah, you know, I, you have this core of your students and you know that I walk into my animal behavior class, they are not going to all come out as animal behaviorists. That's just not going to happen. So what's the goal? The goal I think um, is a to uh, present the complexity in a simple way, right? So if I, I want them to be able to look at the world and say, huh, there's more going on in my backyard than I'd anticipated. Or look at a squirrel and say, you know, there's more to that squirrel's behavior than just a single-minded search for a nut, you know? And so part of it is to uh, to sort of pull back the curtain on aspects of the natural world that even kids interested in the natural world might not know exist. But also to really inspire wonder. And to me, the longer I teach, the more I realize that content delivery is secondary in my role as an instructor. So I'm going to have them, even if I have them in a class every semester for their four years, that's just four years of their life, um, they're going to graduate. And they are going to be uh, the scientist in their neighborhood. They are going to be their scientist in the PTA. Their responsibility, whether it's fair or not, is to explain all science to all people, right? So uh, my dad, I love him so much, will be outside. He'll look up at the sky. He goes, what kind of cloud is that? I'm like, dad, I I don't know what kind of cloud that is. <laughs> I go, well, you're a scientist. How can you not know what cloud that is? At which point my wife, who's a middle school teacher and no science teacher knows everything about everything, will tell him it's a you know, cumulonimbus cloud. Hmm. But, you know, that's going to be their life. They're going to be that person in their community. And they're going to need two things in order to do that effectively. The first is capacity to explain. Can they take an idea and not just spit jargon back to a person and leave them gobsmacked as to what just happened? And will they have a sense of wonder and curiosity that will drive them to continue to read, to continue to explore, even if it's just to read the National Geographic every month, right? And so I think that teaching and comics, and comics for me is is sort of approaching it from you know, my target audience is probably middle school, high school, college kids. I write comics, uh, and the term I always use is all ages, which apparently is like saying something's G, uh, which is just <laughs> taboo. Don't ever say that to a publisher. I write all ages books. Ah! Uh, but the all ages I've got in my mind are Looney Tune cartoons, right? Mm-hmm. Um, stories that have layers. So that my dad and I and my mom and my sister could watch a Looney Tunes cartoon and uh, Heidi and I could sit there and laugh at Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck slapstick and mom and dad could laugh at the wordplay, you know, and both groups could be entertained, both could be engaged, they could share that experience. And then the material actually grows with you too, right? So as I got older, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, Bugs Bunny just turned, you know, pronoun trouble. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, Looney Tunes cartoon. But I want to help teach kids to continue to explore, to continue to grow into their understanding of the natural world. 
And I think that, you know, can start middle school uh, and I think it should persist until you're 80. Um, and I think that, so that's my general philosophy mm. in class. And that's my general philosophy when I'm making comics. Hmm. That's really interesting. In some ways, I see you and your wife as a tag team, like your wife sort of primes them. And then if they come to you, then you sort of fill them with all the detail. And, you know, you sort of draw them down to the, let's read a textbook on the weekend level if they, you know, are willing to follow that rabbit trail uh, or that direction, right? That would be, wouldn't that be great to have a couple people to hang out with and read textbooks on the weekend? I'm still waiting for that. (laughs) There's one other person I remember. He was a developer in Germany that I worked with and he would love it when the latest uh, PHP manual would come out. He would, (laughs) literally, he would get a coffee, he would hop into the bath and he would read this PHP manual in the bathtub until the water got cold. And that was like his, (laughs) his favorite thing to do. So you're not alone. I think you're in good company in the sketchnote community. I think we're all pretty nerdy in our own ways. So it's good to have you. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. You know, and I found the, the, your book very inspiring. Now, Rob Dimio had introduced me to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, And um, I have looked admiringly at, at Rob and your sketch notes. And so I, I just want you to know, I purchased my, uh, my notebook. I'm getting ready for the fall semester and I will be, I will mm. be embarking. The, the truth is that it's a little intimidating because with comics, I'm a pretty slow thinker. So mm-hmm. with comics, you know, I'll write a script and then I'll go back for that chapter and I'll edit, edit, and I'll kill all my darlings. And mm-hmm. it may take me, it, it takes a huge chunk of time by mm-hmm. comparison. And then, you know, laying out the page, I'll lay out a page two or three times before, you know, the flow is just right uh, and it's unambiguous. And holy mackerel, you guys are, you, you're, you're going to push me to do design <laughs> in on real the fly, time. Yeah. in real time. And that is, that is, I think that's really exciting. It's in this, and yeah. I can understand why. I can understand why someone would be a little nervous about it at the, mm-hmm. at the start, especially if they, you know, are sort of new to drawing and maybe don't have what they consider the appropriate chops. But I, I also, I also want to circle back to your, your comment earlier about, you know, sort of fear of, of how well we draw. Right. So I've had imposter complex my entire life. And I will have it, doesn't matter how many publishers publish my work, I will always feel like eh, I'm not as good as that person or not as good as her. So I, I, I hear you when you tell people, you know, don't be afraid of how well you draw. And I think that that is sometimes hard, it's hard to hear, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't want to believe it. And, and I think sometimes what people should understand is that even people who draw all the time, get nervous about drawing. Like oh, yeah. I will, I will have a page written and planned out and I will put it off for a day. And, and Lisa will go, what, what is wrong with you? I'm like, uh, you know what? I'm just afraid this is going to be the day I sit down on my drawing board and I can't draw anymore. Hmm. Like my, my pencil doesn't work. Uh, I, you know, no, no ideas flow from my head. So that sort of fear is so natural and persistent and almost will always be there that it shouldn't Mm -hmm. it's sort of the background noise right it should never ever be a barrier to doing this Hmm. I had some advice a long time ago when I I didn't know I was actually a speaker and this is probably 10 12 years ago and I did one of these talks it was called uh, pachachka which is a Japanese term for I think like chit chat or something like that but the idea is you have 20 slides, they advance without your control, and you have to give a talk in front of the crowd. <laughs> so I, like, I picked a really great first presentation, right? I was in a bar, and I remember the feeling of being really nervous at first. And then I got in the groove, and I was fine. I talked to a friend named Mark. I said, man, how do I get over like that nervous feeling in the beginning? Do you ever get over that? And he's like, nope, you never get over it. But what I can tell you is learn that that is your excitement. If you realize that that's your excitement for what you're about to do, and you can channel it and turn it towards presenting, sharing, like realize that's your indicator that you're excited. That'll change your mind. And I think that has actually influenced my sketch noting too, because I feel nervous every time I do it, like, especially when I'm teaching, like, oh, am I going to say something dumb and, you know, <laughs> someone's going to catch me or I'm going to, I'll do something unsustainable or whatever. Like, and the, but once I get into the moment, I feel the, I feel that nervousness. But once I get rolling, I sort of realize again, 
this is my excitement about the opportunity. I sort of lean on that as my energy source. And I found that's really helpful. And then I would say the second thing that I've tried to do in all of this, when I say, when I real, once I realized that people were really nervous about drawing and it was pretty universal, my practical <laughs> side kicked in from my dad. And that was, how do I teach people how to do it simply so they don't have to be so afraid of it? And that was this synthesis for taking all these visual libraries that exist in visual thinking circles uh, and narrowing it down to five shapes. So they're pretty easily rememberable and you can generate them on the fly. And it gives you a, we talked about scaffolds or frameworks, it gives you a framework that you can lean on when you're not sure. So that, that I think has um, really helped a lot giving some some people practical things that they can use to form their drawings. That section I thought was particularly effective. I mean, the whole book is very good. But what I liked about that section was the fact that, okay, yes, you get these these basic shapes. But what's effective about it is that since we can all make those shapes, we can all be immediately successful. And to me, that that having those tools for immediate moderate success, whatever. The ability to say, okay, I drew a house. It was a triangle and a box, but it looks like a house. And I know that that's a house. That, that type of internal feedback, there's a model of motivation that I sort of rely on when I teach. Um, and it involves three things that you have to have in line. I'm going to hope, I'm hope I'm not going to pull a Rick Perry here and not remember <laughs> the three. Uh, the first is value. You have to be able to say, okay, this content, this, I can see the value of it. The second is support. You have to feel like, you know what? Okay. I've got a community or I've got a, uh, I've got uh, an instructor who's going to help me get to satisfy uh, the connection with that value. And, and the third is efficacy right? So you have to feel like you can kind of do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not at the expert level, but you have to be able to feel like you can do it. And if you have those three things all there, then your motivation to do something uh, as a student, for example, is higher. And I think that that sort of uh, it resonates with me because, well, that's what I, those are the things I needed. And I think that that, that particular section of the book provides the key critical tools for efficacy. Um, because I think most of us, most people can see, oh yeah, I can understand the value in having images to support. And you know, we're surrounded by people who love us. You can do it, you can do it. But that third component of efficacy to actually be able to do it to the extent that you feel like you're doing it, hmm. right? That to me is, that to me is hugely important. And so, um, I was thinking about those three things as I was reading that particular section. Hmm. Well, that's really good. I'm glad that that message came through because I don't know that I would have expressed it in that way, but I've always felt like you have to feel like there's a, it's a safe space. You have to feel like it's achievable and then you need something to actually achieve it with that's doable. I guess those are cover those three things. So I'm, I'm glad that the message <laughs> made its way through the book. Your thesis was right on buddy. <laughs> So I would love to talk a little bit about, um, you talk about doing books. Is there something new coming that you're excited about that you want to talk about? Yeah. So in that book I mentioned before, Kleinapus, which was the mm -hmm. honeybee book. And that was, I think I started making those comics in 1998. It was collected in 2000 as a black and white graphic novel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be re-released in color with an expanded back matter by Harper Collins. Oh, nice. Uh, next year. So, uh, right now I am revisiting and I, I will tell you that 2020 J looking at 2000 J's artwork and some of the decisions he made 2020 J is not impressed sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, buddy? What is all of this ink? You know, just anyway. So that's what I'm working on right now. That's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. So I'll, I have always wanted to see it in color. Uh, well, I'm running, the one thing about color that I'm really, I'm really struck by is that I grew up in the black and white mm -hmm. comics boom, grew up professionally, I should say, in the 90s. And, you know, for me, black and white comics, it's just, I read Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown was in black and white, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Peanuts, uh, all the comic strips. So it just seemed like, well, what's the big deal? And I went to, uh, I had a book, The Last of the Sandwalkers. It's about Beatles. And I was at a kid's... Uh, book convention kid came up with his mom and 
She's like, oh my gosh, is this about insects? You know, he loves insects, da da da, da. And, and we were talking about it. He was getting so jacked up about it. And I was really thinking, oh man, this is a sale. I'm going to be able to afford <laughs> dinner tonight. And he opens up, he goes, oh, I only, I only buy color books. Oh, wow. Interesting. And that was it. That was it. That was the end of the story. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I got some crayons right here. What would you like in color? Uh, closer. Wow. <laughs> so, so I've always wanted to see it in color, but I think that it's also important because color is, color is so cheap to do now, mm -hmm. uh, uh, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. And, you know, it is another layer of explanation. Mm -hmm. It is another, you know, visual component to can convey information. And so I, I get its significance. So anyway, I'm not sure. Again, I sort of just wandered off there in the woods of thought. Oh, you were that's asking great. about projects. And that's, that's the latest one. And I'm also doing, because I don't have a book to work on right now, I've been doing a lot of uh, single panel insect cartoons mm. on Twitter. And uh, I just did some insect themed mask PSAs, which no oh, one asked. Yeah, no one asked for them. I am the king of, of creating things that no one ever asks for. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later, you're going to strike gold, right? Like, I, I have my fingers crossed. So here's the question. I, I, I think I'm picking up on what it is. So with Clan Aphis, are you going to just colorize the black and white artwork to maintain integrity? Or are you going to, because there would be an opportunity to redraw everything, right? And that could be a whole project in itself if you went that direction. Yeah, so that would be that would be too much work. I am mm. I am at my heart a lazy person, and so um, <laughs> I I have redrawn. A, well, there are probably about ten pages that I redrew elements of. Mm. Again, twenty twenty J was looking mm -hmm. at two thousand J saying, "Look, in this and mostly they were design decisions mm -hmm. because one of the things I always like to keep in mind when I'm making comics is that." there's a good chance this is going to be somebody's first comic, hmm. mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there is a, there's a structural visual language that you have to be in tune to. And, and, and most people pick it up and have it to a certain extent, but in terms of say the flow of reading, where does my eye go? What sequence do I draw, you know, read the word balloons in. And even I've seen professionals make these, what I think are, critical errors in terms of just balloon placement. I can't see how exciting I am. I think about balloon placement, <laughs> but um, you know where that text goes and am I reading it in sequence? And so there were a couple places throughout the book where I thought it could be better. I didn't think it was terrible, but I thought mm -hmm. it could be better. And so I redrew, I had to redraw those elements, but I'm actually having it. It's actually being colored by an artist named um, Hillary. Um, oh my goodness. Hillary's name just went right out of my head. Oh, I'm a terrible person. But she's doing, she's doing beautiful work. Sycamore. Hillary Sycamore. Uh, she's doing beautiful, beautiful work. And, and you know, again, that's a skill that is not mm -hmm. actually part of my skill set. I'm actually sort of working on learning how to color. My kid, my, my oldest son, Max, who does a lot of digital art, is sort of explaining it, showing mm -hmm. me how to do things. Mm -hmm. um, but if it were me coloring it, it would take for, for forever. Hmm. Um, but Hillary, she's, she's cranking through things and it's, it's beautiful. So it's, it's sort of exciting to get a page back that you drew and see someone else's sort of artistic interpretation, mm -hmm. uh, in color layered over it. And, and there are sometimes like, ah, can we do this? But mostly it's like, wow, that's hamana, 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 right? I mean, I would never have thought to do that. And that is beautiful. So, yeah. So it sounds like more like refinements, refinements to the art where you felt like it could, could improve. And then yeah. having someone who knows and is a master with color, apply color, yeah. which is right. kind of like a, it's a little bit like Christmas every time you get some pages. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And, and you know, and I think that this is one of those things that I guess I'm used to as an academic is that, uh, you know, I'm always looking to other people's expertise, mm -hmm. right? I think that that's, that's where humans in general su succeed is when we don't think oh, I can do everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And we actually recognize that there's expertise out there. I mean, unfortunately we live at a time when Anthony Fauci's expertise is called into question. So right. <laughs> expertise right. is sort of under assault. Yes. And I, I do like to acknowledge it and recognize it whenever I can. Hmm. Hmm. 
Well, that's really interesting. It's fun. I'm glad that we could share that uh, this book is coming. And is the original black and white book still available if someone wanted to find it? Or is it out of print now? Like, what's the state of it? Well, um, it was it was on Amazon, but we we have pulled it since okay. the black and white okay. one. Now there there are library versions, mm-hmm. so it was in print for twenty years. Oh, okay. Uh, and the last few leading up to, so we would self published it. Last few leading up to this, it had been print on demand mm. um, through Amazon. But that's been shut down. But so mm-hmm. there's tons of black and white mm-hmm. uh, versions out there, probably on a Libris and, and other places. Or you could find a used copy someplace. It could be oh, fun yeah. For, oh, know, yeah. In, the, in this community, we're nerdy enough that we'd want to have both and see if we could determine like where you made changes and get excited about that. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, that back. would be. I, I encourage everybody to buy two of my books, <laughs> the black go. and white one and the color one. <laughs> So, I mean, the sketchnote community is nerdy enough that we would get, we would be in the bathtub reading with one book in one hand and one in the other and like doing, oh, check it out. Look how he moved that, that balloon, the speech <laughs> balloon got moved over there. I wonder yes. why I did that. Oh, that uh, looks that, much better. That's why, that's why I feel like I could be a part of this community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, we can get pretty nerdy. Um, so I would love to hear, uh, about the tools that you use. What what are your favorite analog tools? And it sounds like maybe you're getting into digital a little bit or maybe a lot, um, and then your digital tools after that. So uh, my analog are, um, I have a, a moleskin sketchbook uh, that I like to work in. I have a, uh, a Koenor mechanical pencil mm-hmm. that I use. So I sketch in pencil. When I do pages, so the sketchbook, it works as a character design book. It works as, you know, practicing on sort of camera angles for various scenes mm-hmm. on various panels. And it's nice because I can take it everywhere with me. Mm-hmm. It's one of the first books like that lays open enough that it's comfortable, mm-hmm. but not, I've never been, I know lots of people love spiral. I, that spiral I've never been able to do. I can't, I don't yeah. know why. So that's like sort of working things up. When it's time to do something final, um, I typically uh, pencil a comic page in, well, I started penciling in just regular pencil and then I would erase after I'd inked it. Mm-hmm. But I've started using uh, blue ink, uh, blue pencil lead. Oh yeah. 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 So that way I don't have to do any erase. It doesn't lift any of the ink off the page, mm-hmm. which, which I like. So I'll, I'll draw, do the underdrawing in, in, in blue. And then um, I, ha- I use Rapidograph mechanical pens. Mm-hmm. Each one's a different line weight. Uh, I just use, like, there's a classic set of five you can buy in a little box. I think they still make them. And I use those five. Uh, I don't get much thicker than that. I don't get any thinner than the, the, the lower end. Um, so any kind of variation on line weight for the most part is because I've uncapped and recapped and I'm going mm. back and forth between pens. And I tell some people that and they think I'm absolutely loony. But um, <laughs> the truth is that the line is so reliable mm-hmm. and so so clean that I really like it. But is I can't remember exactly when I picked up the – well, there was there's a comic called Bone by Jeff Smith. Uh, and it came out and started coming out in the 90s. I picked up issue three. I have them all. It's, I, it's a tremendous book. It's in color from Scholastic, if anyone's interested. Um, but he uses a brush. Mm-hmm. And so I try to use a brush, and I do not have brush skills. But <laughs> I found a brush pen, and it's got a Japanese name. Uh, I, mean, okay. I, I can send it to you if you're interested. Sure. And so. Uh, that I've slowly started working. So now my art has this hybrid feel mm-hmm. and there, and I get more and more confident with producing lines of varying weight, you know, mm-hmm. thin at the end, thick in the middle, so on and so forth. And so there is also, and I oh, I forgot, failed to mention the paper. I use Bristol board, okay. like a smooth vellum and, um, and a ruler, a ru- mm-hmm. I have a clear see-through ruler. You mm. can actually, I'm holding it in front of my face right Some now. Straight edges then. 
Yeah. So this is a Westcott and I like it because the bevel is really nice. Mm. And the bevel is important because when I'm inking with technical pen, if you don't use the bevel right, then it just bleeds all over the place. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that, that was probably TMI in terms of... No, that's, uh, you're, you're right in the zone here. This is what we're looking for. <laughs> so so those are, those are the primary um, analog tools and lots of white out because I screw mm-hmm. things up routinely. I, every once in a while, I'll use micron pens, mm-hmm. um, especially the thinner weight ones because they're really good for putting in sort of light hatching to... Mm-hmm. When, it, when you're doing strictly black and white, laying out something in terms of a shadow or sh- or shading or sculpting uh, the shape of something, um, then that that's all scanned, right? So I have like this Epson's printer and the, the pages I draw, the, the, they're about, they're 10 by 15 in terms mm. of their dimensions. So they'll be reduced by about 60% for mm-hmm. typical comic book size. So I scan the two page uh, I scan the page in two parts and stitch it together into mm. one file. Okay. In terms of other digital stuff, most of what I do is draw things analog. So I haven't really drawn anything digitally. Uh, my son, Max, he's really good at that. He's got a Wacom tablet. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got one of those young sort of plastic brains. Mine's mm-hmm. all fossilized. Uh, <laughs> so, so he's capable of drawing some amazing things and then coloring them in very interesting ways. I, and you know, actually, I'm about to tell you something and it connects directly back to cave painting because mm. I scan my images, I put them in the Photoshop and then using my finger and my touchpad, I color them in Photoshop. And Interesting. It's, it really is like finger painting, right? I don't use a mouse. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a Wacom stylus. Mm. I'm just coloring things in with my fingers. Hmm. Wow. You might, be really good, you might be a good candidate for an iPad Pro with a, with a pencil where you could do that stuff with a stylus. That could be Yeah, you know, I, I have looked at that. And I think that especially teaching at home, I wanted to do some of that mm. work as well. But when you have two kids in college, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the capacity for super duper luscious, sexy technology like that is somewhat limited. <laughs> yep, yep. Totally understandable. And I was going to go back to the tool list that you said. So for blue pencil, for people that don't know, um, the reason you use blue pencil is you can go into tools like Adobe Photoshop. There's a name for that pencil. It's like color something. Because I, I used to be a uh, print designer for a long time. Uh, the pencil I, I use is a Pilot Color Eno. Okay. And um, let me see here. I'm sitting I right. It's, it's, I think it's called non-repro, non-repro blue. That's yes. the color. It's a right. certain color hue. Yeah. And the, the, I got, I use the Eno color. It's from pilot, right? I already mm. said that. Okay. And it's called soft blue. Mm. And okay. so, yeah. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll draw something and I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll scan it mm-hmm. or I'm not scan it, but I'll, I'll use a Xerox machine. I'll make a copy of it. And it does not pick up, mm-hmm. does not pick up the blue at all. So it's like the machine erases it for you. Yeah, there's, it's a little bit like uh, if you're into video stuff, you know how you buy these green screens on Facebook now that pop up? Um, right. It's a key, so it's a key in color that you can identify and drop uh, without erasing. So as an old printer, I identified that right away Yeah. where you're going. And then the second thing, I think when you talk about the importance of the bevel on that uh, straight edge, I think the way you do it, if I understand, is you flip it so the bevel is pointing upward so that there's no contact with the page. So basically right. make sure that the the pen uh, is not in contact with the straight edge because what happens is the straight edge will draw the ink underneath and then, oh man, it's a mess. I've been there. It's capillary action science. Yes. There we go. <laughs> science everywhere, man. It is. Know. You just can't get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much not. So, and the last thing I was going to say, Rob DeMio actually got into Co- uh, Koenor, um Rapidographs. I think they're that. They're some form of rapidograph pens, and you can buy them. He bought a set, and he's pretty excited. The thing about those kind of pens is they have a very specific way in which they operate, a little bit like brush pens do too, that you have to sort of accept. Right? You can't use it like a like a felt tip pen and use it in any way you like. Right. There's a way that you need to use them, and if you use them that way, they're awesome. 
but you have to respect the tool for the way that it operates. Yeah, it was a it was actually a big transition for me because when I was uh, as an undergraduate uh, at DePaul University, we had a newspaper that came out twice a week, and um, I was the cartoonist for three years, sophomore and senior year, and I had a cartoon in every one, and I also was a moron because I draw things in pencil and then I would ink them with a ballpoint pen. And mm. now it should it should be underscored here that it was not even that systematic. I would go in, I would draw something in pencil, then I would go into the the office and I would grab whatever pen was there. <laughs> so there, there were times when it was inked with a felt tip and ink or inked with a blue ballpoint and we had to do some funky stuff to get it. And then I went to graduate school at Notre Dame and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to do cartoons here too. And so I submitted some stuff and I, that, that was a daily strip for five years. Hmm. And they immediately said, well, you can't use a ballpoint pen to ink. I'm like, well, <laughs> well, what do you fancy people use? <laughs> and there were, there was somebody uh, and she was working paste up and she was doing so. This is when you physically pasted yep. up the newspaper and uh, she she had these rapinographs. She's like, I really like these. And so she actually took a minute to show me how they worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I made the investment. There was a art store in South Bend called McKelsky's. It's no longer there, but man, they set me up. And it, it just changed everything. Mm -hmm. I, I went from being a complete and utter rube of a, an amateur to a, an amateur dangerously armed with effective tools. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you talk about, F I mentioned efficacy before, mm -hmm. the sense that you could do something and having that correct tool, suddenly I could make artwork that looked a little bit more like what I had was aspiring to do. And I, you know, I also talk about with my students, this, teeter-totter of creativity. You have to be self-critical enough to say, I can do better. But you have to be delusional enough to say, that's pretty good though, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And at any one point, hopefully the bar is always raising and you're still fooling yourself a little bit so that you can keep going. But that moment with those pens was the moment when I said, oh, this these two line weights are different. And that looks just like what John Byrne mm. did in this mm -hmm. corner of that panel of that comic. And I suddenly felt like, Oh, I could really actually do this. Mm. And that, that, that to me was a, a pretty important tool. Yeah. Yeah. I made that connection, right? He's like, Oh, that's how John Byrne is doing that. Like right. it's not right. magic. It's actually two pens. And it was interesting because I met him once at a comic con and I asked him what his tools were. And his response was, anything that will make a mark on a page. Hmm. And so that was also the point at which I thought, wow, okay, so me having all these different rapidographs, all these different pencils, that's not weird. That is maybe mm -hmm. for some people just the way they approach their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you for sharing all those tools. I was thinking the, the word that you might have been looking for for that Japanese brush pen, was it... Um, Kurataki, but yes, you, yeah, yes, yes, that's so the that's, one. That's one one that I carry with me everywhere now. Is uh, Pentel produces one. It's a pocket brush pen with cartridges, mm -hmm. and that's really great because I can cap it in my carry it in my pocket. And I would, when I used to travel, I would take <laughs> I would take a sketchbook and I would sketch scenes or food or whatever with that brush pen. And I think I liked it because it forced me to be looser than I normally was would be with other pens, like other pens sort of you know, we're a single line and there was a limit, like I could make the the faintest of lines with the brush pen, or I could make a big dark area. And that was really attractive, even though I, I often feel like I don't know what I'm doing with it. I've not been really trained deeply in it. I just sort of use it for what makes sense to me. And I kind of like what it produces. So that's good enough. It's sort of the teeter totter, right? <laughs> I guess. No, it is. And, and I think that, <laughs> you know, I'm, I think expertise is important. And I think that there's a lot to be said uh, for art training. And I wish, I wish I'd had more, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I was very much the science kid, although I loved the liberal arts where I was, but I didn't, I didn't take courses that taught me and trained me, but I've decided that I can't, I can't well, allow that to be a barrier. So I'm mm -hmm. the same way with the brush pen. I've not been trained to use it. And I, 
And I do feel sort of like, you know, a hick from Indiana who's handling <laughs> some fancy piece of nice equipment. And, uh, and it's real nice and it's much better than I can do, but I'm going to putter around with it as best I can because mm-hmm. um, ultimately it's a tool for me to express my thoughts. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you make it selfish like that, <laughs> I think that it can be, it can, it can be as good as you want it to be. And, yeah. but it also, it also, you know, I think that it also provides a certain amount of play, which, you know, I've been using Cornell Repetographs since 1990. And that, the, when I say my brain is fossilized, I, I do, I slip into grooves and I say, well, this is what I do. And this pen forces me to play. It forces me to fail, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm perfectly capable of failing with a rapidograph. Don't get me wrong. But the failure rate is lower because I'm much more comfortable with mm-hmm. aha moments that I don't necessarily get with, with the rapidographs, right? And so as I'm messing around with this brush pen, not knowing what I'm doing, every once in a while I bonk into success and <laughs> I figure out how to do something that it will make me more effective elsewhere. and those moments don't happen like they used to happen when we were kids, right? When we were kids, you don't know anything. You're an idiot. I tell my children this all the time. That's why I'm father of the year. You know, (laughs) you guys don't know anything. (laughs) But, you know, not knowing anything is sort of exciting Mm -hmm. because, you know, that means when you do something new, it's the first time you've ever experienced it. It's the first time that you've – and those experiences happen – less frequently, especially once you get sort of, as I said, fossilized into how you approach your Mm -hmm. visualizations. And so the pen for me is, and and it was not my wife's favorite. She did not like the pen at first. And I Mm -hmm. don't blame her because at first I was really crappy with it, but she will now grudgingly say, okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, Mm -hmm. It looks all right. You know? And I mean, so for me, it, it, it's, it reintroduces that uh, a little bit of safe struggle. Right. So I'm not really being thrown out there. My job's not relying on me doing well with this pen, but I actually don't want to screw this page up. So there's, there's a little bit of that. And that to me sort of keeps things fresh and keeps me learning just a little bit. Mm, Good tension. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So um, this is where I typically ask uh, guests to share some tips with people who are listening. I sort of frame it that Imagine there's someone who's listening, they're into sketchnoting or visualization, they're excited about it, and they want to level up a little bit, and they would love to hear some advice from you. What would be three things you could share with them, either practical or theoretical? Okay, so I guess the first would be to, and I think this is sort of uh, amplifies what you've already said in your book, which is you just can't be afraid. And I, and I don't know where that, I think it's funny, the fear is oftentimes, at least for me, of, of what other people will say. Mm-hmm. What are other people going to say? I think one of, the, one of the great points you make repeatedly in the sketch notebook is that this is uh, it's just for you. It's not for anybody else necessarily. And it could be for other people. But first and foremost, this is for you. This is for you to record an experience that may be important for you later. I love the bits in the book where people said, yeah, I would take voluminous notes. I take voluminous notes. I never read those voluminous notes, right? As the chair of my department, my people will say, Jay, why haven't you done that? I said, well, I took notes on it, but I, I don't remember. <laughs> Can you tell me, what, tell me what you wanted me to do one more time? I took three pages of notes on it, but I've never looked at them again. So uh, don't be afraid, which is a very simple thing I know to say, but this is for you. It's not for anybody else at, at first. The second is find that tool that feels right in your hand. Not every pen does. Uh, not every pencil does for me. And I have, I've spent considerable amount of money on um, a pencil or a pen that I hated <laughs> and never picked up again, right? This, this Pentel thing that I ink the pencil with, I think this is like a, like a 95 cent, you know, <laughs> But, but it's got this rubber thing right here that's just the right size. Mm. It feels just right in my hand. So 
you know, don't be afraid to go in because I think that if you go and you pick the wrong tool, you're going to say, oh, I don't want to do this because it's got to feel good, right? I mean, it would be like saying, hey, um, let's, let's go out in the backyard and learn to shoot jump shots at our hoop. And boys, I want you to wear high heels, right? Mm -hmm. That would be a miserable experience. It would be <laughs> no fun, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not the right tool. So, you know, find that thing that fits right in your hand uh, that allows ideas to just sort of flow out. Uh, that's going to sound all metaphysical, but I, I really do think, you know, there's this flow from the brain to the arm to the hand, and uh, you don't want to be fighting with your tool. Mm -hmm. So it, it's worth taking the time in an art store just to poke around and find the thing. And the last thing is once you've done those two things, and you realize what you're doing is pretty okay, then you, you need to share it. And one of the things I tell kids who come up to me at, you know, comic conventions and stuff, how do I get started? I'm like, look, uh, when I got started, if I wanted anybody to see my comics, I either had to a run around my dorm and say, Hey, what do you think of this? Is this funny? Or I could go to the newspaper, right? And the newspaper would print it. Those are the first way is obnoxious. And the second way, well, it's got levels of, it's got barriers and difficulty and whether or not you're going to get accepted and blah, 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 blah. The internet now makes it free. Now, I wish I had more than 300 followers on Instagram because I look at some people that have got eight gajillion. Yeah, but you know. know what? If you've got a voice, if you've got a style um, that resonates with people, it's a fantastic way. It's cheap. It's easy. I mean, you can draw something, as you say in your book, draw something, take a picture of it, post it, and suddenly you could have 100 people looking at what you do, commenting on what you do. And again, efficacy and support. So you know you can do it. You put it out there. You get the support. And at the same time, those voices may also be echoing the value that, they ha that you have in there. And so I think you have to be very um, deliberate and self-conscious about setting up uh, positive feedback loops. Mm. Uh, now, that could be read as, as a vanity. And as someone who's, who loves himself and just loves talking about himself, I can get that, <laughs> right? But I mean, I think that it's okay to set up systems that amplify successes and actually point out de deficits, right? I mean, because the only way you ever refine what you do is figuring out what people respond to and what people don't, mm -hmm. I think. If it's ever going to be anything beyond just for yourself. And so, you know, I think that the, the internet tools, now the internet can be a horrible, horrible, horrible place. Don't get oh, me yeah. wrong. But yeah. I think typically people have gotten better at, at curating their communities to the extent that that they can be very supportive and, and effective places mm -hmm. to, to show your work. Mm. Those are great, great tips. Thank you for sharing those, Jay. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you and follow you? We need to increase your, your, uh, your Instagram <laughs> followers. You know so. what? I, the minute I said that, I'm like, oh, my kids are going to just totally cringe. Oh, dad, you're, you're begging for attention. <laughs> that said, <laughs> yeah, you know, I should know my, ins I think it's, I think it's Jay Hostler on Instagram. Okay. And, um, on Twitter, oh gosh, I'm the worst. I guess we can always Google search you, but do you have a website or anything like that you could point I do. to? Okay. Yes, that is jhostler.com. And okay, good. if you go to that, um, there's a section on science comics. So if you're a teacher, there are, are a bunch of um, science comics that you can use, photosynthesis, cellular mm -hmm. respiration, ATP, a whole bunch of different things that I've been putting together over the years for my classes that are free to download. And in fact, mm. there's actually, if you're a super nerd, there's a book I did called Optical Illusions. It was funded by a National Science Foundation grant and it's about the eye. And it's a hybrid comic book textbook mm -hmm. about um, essentially eye evolution, biology, structure, function. And that all 128 pages is downloadable as a PDF for free. Mm. That's pretty cool. Want. And you, yeah. do, you definitely have books out there on Amazon and Yes. I imagine if you go to the website, you'll see book resources. So yeah. And so, those. right. And so there's actually a tab that has all the books too. Cool. Cool. 
Well, that's we'll send people there and we'll have links, of course, in the show notes like we always do for everything we've talked about and all the all the places that you can go check things out about Jay. Jay, thanks so much for being on the show. This has really been a blast. I've enjoyed this so much. This was uh, one of my favorite conversations in a very long time, Mike. You asked uh, great questions and you allowed me to meander like an elderly person through memory <laughs> lane. <laughs> and everybody in the community is going to love it because this is this is the nerdy stuff that we get into. So this is our this is our version of uh, cracking open the old uh, tech the new textbook um, on the weekend for us. I'm I glad think. to be a part of that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks. And everyone who's listening, this will wrap this show for this episode. And we'll talk to you in the next episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Road Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of the show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or... Go to peachpit.com and use the code ROADY40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.